And welcome to our special episode of Creative Commons Open Culture Voices. I'm Brigitte Wisner, Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons. I'm here today with Jocelyn Miara, Open Culture Manager, and Connor Benedict, Open Culture Coordinator, who will moderate this episode. And if you don't know Open Culture Voices, it's a series of interviews with distinguished open culture experts from around the world, speaking in many different languages, on what it's like to open up heritage content online. So far, we've featured almost 50 experts in the series, and there's plenty more to come. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that it has engaged more than 3 million people across multiple platforms to date and has helped raise awareness and share knowledge around the transformative impact of open access to cultural heritage globally. Today, we're gathering insights under a different format and we're very excited to host this polyphonous conversation with experts from diverse backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives to really take a deep dive into some of the fundamental issues affecting open culture today. So they'll introduce themselves in a moment, but I wanted to extend a very warm welcome to you, Andrea, Medavi, Michael, and Cam and Scan. You work in Europe, North America, Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and you are among the most esteemed experts on the topic of openness to cultural heritage. And it's an honor for us to have you with us today. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Um, unlike a regular episode, which will, features only one guest answering four standard questions, this episode will be a dialogue among peers and truly an opportunity to earnestly address the thorniest questions that have surfaced in the series and those that haven't yet, and those that need a longer, more extensive exchange of views and those that are bound to spark a lively debate. And this conversation is timely for two main reasons. In September 2022, UNESCO member states adopted the Mondial Declaration, certainly one of the most important cultural policy instruments of the past decades, and declared culture a global public good. I think it's worth underscoring that with this declaration, member states, and I quote, commit to foster an enabling environment conducive to the respect and exercise of all human rights, in particular cultural rights, individual and collective in all areas of culture, from cultural heritage to cultural and creative sectors, including in the digital environment, in order to build a more just and equitable world and reduce inequalities, including for women, youth, children, indigenous peoples, people of African descent, persons with disabilities and vulnerable groups, in particular by supporting inclusive access to culture and participation in cultural life and its benefits as an ethical, social, and economic imperative." End quote. So in 2023, we find ourselves at this pivotal moment where open culture has bloomed and flourished in many beautiful dimensions, but we're still only about 1% of the world's cultural heritage have open access policies. So my main question to you is, can open culture deliver on this commitment to support inclusive access to culture and participation in cultural life. And second, um, as Creative Commons Open Culture Program is about to complete its second year, I think it's fair to say that our ecosystem has been deeply disrupted uh, by new technologies, uh, generative AI in particular, and that questions about sustainability, accessibility, and equity feel more momentous than ever. So it seems like now is the right time to gaze into the future and for us to sketch a blueprint for open culture and better sharing, one that might inform our direction of travel for the coming years and beyond. So I'm again, absolutely thrilled that you're all here today and leave you in the able hands of my colleague, Connor Benedict. Over to you, Connor. All right, thank you so much, Brigitte. Um, that was fantastic, a fantastic introduction. I think this is a 
Good moment to do introductions from everyone. Also, so very much like to hear um, why open culture is important to you locally. My goal with this question is kind of to get um, something a bit more specific about maybe your community, your cultural country, for example, rather than what you think the value of open culture is globally. Um, so my name is Andrea Wallace. I am a uh, associate professor of law and technology at the University of Exeter, um, which is in the United Kingdom. And um, for me, open culture is really important locally because um, it's a way to think creatively about how to make connections among um, collections, individuals, histories, narratives um, that previously hasn't actually been possible because of the analog nature um, of heritage and heritage management, um, but also how centralized it typically is within a given institution. Um, I'm um, uh, Michael Peter Edson. And I have been newly named the founding director of the Museum of Solutions in Mumbai, which is a new purpose-built state-of-the-art institution dedicated to helping young people and future generations solve the real problems uh, in the world. And, uh, if I were a shoemaker, I would care about this from the shoemaker's perspective. But I'm a museum professional really dedicated to helping these institutions around the world do more good more quickly and uh, open content, open culture, open source software, the open collaborative read-write web has just been incredibly important to that, uh, that thought process and that movement. Uh, but as Bridget said in the introduction, we have an awful long way to go. So uh, I am the editor founder of uh, the Heritage Lab, which is a web uh, publishing platform and it actually started as a school initiative it started as a way to take museums into schools to talk about creative inquiry to merge history arts and learning together and also look at um, answering certain questions that are important and relevant to the times we live in um, this is important to me open culture is important to me because i started with um, I started my career working with artisans and craftspeople, and my main interest was in building participation with the arts, because uh, when I was in MBA college, um, none of my peers knew about traditional arts and crafts, and I wondered why. Um, but in this journey that I've had over the last decade, even though I worked at the grassroots, traveling village to village, meeting with artisans and craftspeople, hardly documenting my journeys, because uh, you don't take pictures when you're working with artisans and craftspeople uh, in a setting that is so intimate. But I realized that the knowledge of the craft was at museums often, like the background knowledge about a lot of a uh, lot of contextual knowledge. And so we started taking artisans and craftspeople to museums. Um... Um, I'm based in Uruguay, uh, but I'm actually from Argentina, <laughs> so I'm going to use that as a, I'm going to cheat a little bit on your prompt. And so you said that we are not supposed to uh, talk about it globally, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the region where I live in, which is Latin America. And I think that open culture is important for Latin America too, to change the representations about Latin America. I think it's very important that we put out there our stories and our heritage in ways that actually represent our culture. Um, and I think that we see this a lot too, you know, like in the US, for example, there's the whole like um, Latino, Hispanic Heritage Month. And some of those representations aren't necessarily related to what we as Latin Americans think in our Latin American culture is and our roots are. And so I think that a way to combat that, to like, kind of um, uh, give a different way of looking at that perspective is by putting more culture out there. So that's kind of my my two cents to the conversation. My name is Nkem Osigwe. I work for African Library and Information Associations and Institutions, AFLIA, with headquarters in Accra, Ghana. I'm the director in charge of uh, training and human capacity development. And why is open culture important to me? It, you know, because I, I am a Nigerian and um, in my culture, so, some stuff are open and some are not. And I'm wondering, 
How can we open up knowledge about the things we do, who we are, and maybe open culture can help us to do that, especially those um, areas that uh, that it is allowed. Because again, there are some there are some areas where uh, um, women are not even allowed to 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 join those groups to learn some things. So yes, open culture is important to me as um, somebody from Nigeria, from the um, Igbo tribe. Thank you very much. Um, so my first question for us all is, how do you experience the state of open culture or open glam or the open movement currently? I'll, um, I'll jump into that, Connor. Yeah. It, um, uh, you know, when I when I first started watching the Open Voices series, mm -hmm. uh, Madhavi had a great video. Um, uh, a bunch of other, you know, glam, open glam gallery, library, archive, museum luminaries and and visionaries uh, had great videos but it struck me that uh I, I was feeling like our narrative was a little um stale in a way like the stories we were telling about open glam were the same kind of hopeful important strident open stories that we had been telling for 10 years almost uh and i feel like in a way the movement, the open glam movement has kind of stalled in the way that movements do. Um, you get the rush of early revolution. Uh, you have a shared adversary, an exciting vision, lots of new ground to uh, explore and you learn and do quickly. You make connections and lifelong friends and you do real consequential work. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, movements have life cycles. Uh, they get into middle age, uh, as, as do some of us <laughs> in our physical bodies as well. Um, things get complicated. In the, the decade and a half that I've been kind of high on, on the open movement, the internet has changed. The internet has been colonized uh, by some bad actors. People have a, a lot of ambivalence or even new generations of, of internet citizens aren't really even aware or in touch with the founding vision of uh, and the, the powerful idealism and, and our preoccupation with stories about Cambridge Analytica and uh, um, uh, you know, enclosure uh, um, and uh, the monetization and kind of capture of the web have overtaken the stories about the, the good that it can do through connection, openness, sharing. Uh, so I feel like the movement is really at a, at a crossroad now, and it's time to take stock and adjust tactics and uh, be realistic about what we've accomplished and what works and what the mission is moving forward. And jump in and, and give a big plus one to that. Um, I think that, you know, we're kind of in a moment of reflection. We've had a lot of um, early and, uh, arrivers and bigger institutions who have carved out some really important paths and taken some big risks um, in kind of helping all of us think through um, what open culture, open glam can be. And at the same time, um, we're kind of now sitting on a lot of data, a lot of digital assets, um, a lot of institutional paths that have followed that model. Um, and we have an opportunity to think about what we want open culture to be. Um, I think there's a big opportunity for us to um, revisit some of this from like a ground up and grassroots sort of approach to think about on more of an individualized level, whether that's smaller, um, more disenfranchised organizations and institutions, as well as individuals who want to have a say in that conversation um, to really inform the direction of, of open glam. Um, but it's also a huge opportunity for us to re uh, think about how we redistribute agency contr and control um, around this movement and around the direction of it. And I think that goes back to um, some of what, you know, Michael was discussing around um, openness and um, digital really transforming uh, the, the mission, the structure, the, the, the practices of an institution um, in, a, in a really central way. And so um, those lessons are still there. And the bigger question is what we're going to do with them to apply them in, in maybe more challenging and newer contexts. 
Well, maybe can I bring also the <laughs> like I, I'm gonna bring my uh, voice on the on the topic and disagree <laughs> in one point, which I think is that it might look like oh we're in a state conversation and like the open movement has been discussing this for ages, right? And you know Andrea has, Andrea and Douglas McCarty have done a lot of work to actually identify you know what for uh, status of the open movement or open ground, so to speak, around the world. And we know that like, even when this um, um, discourse of open ground or open culture might seem like middle age, for a lot of people here in all parts of the world, and probably Ned Harvey will agree with me on this, in all parts of the world, this hasn't been the case. We haven't had this conversation and we haven't had like, the huge wins that institutions in Europe and North America have had on releasing open culture. For us, this is a constant struggle, not only in terms of like, oh, you know, trying to convince cultural heritage institutions that this is important, but also it is a constant struggle for because of the realities that they face. Like sometimes digitization is not a priority, copyright is not a priority. Um, just a reminder that most countries in Latin America actually don't have uh, limitations and exceptions to copyright law for uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. We don't have those. Uh, people cannot like study without like uh, being subject to maybe facing criminal charges for doing things as um, simple as copying um, um, a document. And so whenever we talk about access in uh, some parts of the world, like it seems that the conversation is already like past its prime and now we need to discuss other things. I think that for us, these matters are still like, haven't been discussed at length and we still need to keep on discussing them. And not only because like it's important still, but also because I don't think that necessarily for us, like the internet has been a decolonial space, right? Like for us, the internet was born colonized. And so I think this is a narrative that we also need to um, kind of question, uh, particularly from the places that we are coming from. Absolutely, sorry, I absolutely agree to that. And um, like 200%, but I also want to add in that um, open culture has the term culture also, and how we experience culture is also really different in mm -hmm. um, maybe the global south and the global north. I, I don't understand that um, it is equal, but because when I started the Heritage Lab, it started with a research question as to what are we expecting out of cultural institutions, and then the digital part of it. Uh, but it turned out that not many people were looking for this material online as well. It, it, so it first became about sharing that this material exists online and then seeing whether there can be a possibility for reuse, for sharing. Um, it, I remember a time when I had to plead museums to share a picture with me that I could publish with a story and convince them about the use of putting it online uh, to a time when the pandemic hit and all museums wanted to share um, 3D digital uh, you know, galleries, and now that the pandemic is over, it's not a priority at all again, and things have gone back to where they really were. So I think I experience open culture as a movement in a state of flux from wanting to listen because it's convenient right now and not wanting to listen or share or have a dialogue about it even because it's not priority as um, Evelyn mentioned earlier on. So I think, um, it's, it's also about understanding that when scholars write about certain topics or look at certain archives, use certain material, um, open culture tends to pull them towards the material that exists freely accessible with an open license. And that's when um, museums, for instance, in India, do not have a way to reach those scholars anymore because then it would need the scholar to come down to a different country, uh, request the archives, go through an entirely bureaucratic process, a nightmare to be very honest, to even get some material for their research. So in a sense, what ends up happening is that, this, that the representation does not make it to a published piece of work. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this, this missing link of how we experience uh, open culture is also something that I've been um, very uh, 
recently I've been having discussion with museum leaders about this. That, um, that I think is really interesting about, you know, kind of the underlying connective thread across all the comments so far is, um, is kind of the bias in the data, right? So if we look at who's been um, working in open culture, who's been kind of contributing and shaping, shaping the movement so far, I think that relates to um, a lot of what Scan and Madabi were talking about. So um, I was just punching some numbers from you know the spreadsheet that that Doug and I manage um, for a paper that I'm working on, and like as of today, we have like 1,616 um, organizations around the world that publish some or all of their digital collections under open licenses or or dedicate them to the public domain. And of course, that's our um, kind of entry point for how we collect instances of you know open glam activity. Um, but uh, for more than like 1400 are in the US, the UK and the EU alone. So when we look at geographic representation of who is shaping open glam, um, we need to start thinking kind of along the lines of how we started this discussion um, about more equitable approaches to um, what open glam looks like going forward. Um, because so much of what's been published is held within those countries, it's digitized within those countries, it's published by institutions in those countries. Um, and that naturally shapes where attention flows when we're thinking about reuse of digital assets and data sets and the data structures and everything that surrounds um, institutional practice and focus. And so there's a lot of voices that aren't represented um, in that space at the moment. And so I think, um, you know, again, going and thinking about some of the other questions that we're, we're going to be discussing around um, technology and, and how things are being leveraged. This is a point that SCAN has made. Rather than going big and going deeper on like one specific thing, how do we start to think about agreements and transfer of resources to areas and what those partnerships look like um, among institutions so that um, we are actively um, and positively shaping what open culture looks like um, in the future to be more representative? Yeah. yeah. Can I say something to that point that Andrea is making that I think it's also very important? It's not only that, that like the data representation problem that Andrea is mentioning, it's also another challenge, which I think is uh, related to something that Andrea also too has written. Uh, it's the problem that when, like, we also are in some sort of colonial relationship with some of this uh, uh, digital heritage materials, right? Because, of course, like institutions, in Europe and North America also held, hold among their uh, collections stuff that um, are the byproducts of violence or colonization. And um, of course, they do decide to digitize some of those things uh, without necessarily asking permission to those cultures that have been colonized or um, or their uh, cultural objects that have ended up through like violent means in their collections. And they still like do the digitization, but the people that actually are the like sort of uh, speaking like the rightfully like um, heritage um, heirs of that uh, culture do not get a say on how the material is shared, under what conditions, what are the priorities in terms of digitization. But it also like creates another bigger problem, which I think is underlying this conversation too, is that when you're managing your the the culture, the knowledge, you also create more knowledge around your own culture. And this is the main thing that we are taking away when people do not get the opportunity to actually go through these processes of um, digitizing stuff, opening stuff up. So I'm going to like put it in an example so it's even clearer. If you're an institution in Latin America, and uh, a university in the US digitizes your newspapers, you might get the digital products of that. But what have you learned in that relationship? Nothing. You've learned nothing about digitization. You've learned nothing about copyright. You've learned nothing about uh, managing your own culture and your own heritage. And I think this is like the most problematic relationship that we still have today too. But let me go back a little bit to why I think this is important. Okay, let me leave that. What I think is that people, 
there needs to be more awareness about openness, you know, how do you open things up? How do you open the other one up? You know, what are the benefits? Why I'm saying that is that, you see, when people do not know about you, who you are, what you stand for, where you come from, and the things that make up who you are as that's your, your, your cultural fabric, it's easy to um, it's easy to exclude people. It's easy to misunderstand what people do or where they are coming from because you don't really know who they are or what the things that are meaningful to them. So open culture will help us to learn that. And how can it um, how can it work for us? Let's say in um, in Africa, how can it work for us in Nigeria? You know, I see that you have to think of the ethical issues. Is it okay to open up this um, aspect of the culture? Is it okay to is it okay for people to understand why they need um, things to be open? How can people become how can it become the norm that knowledge about everything is um, is open. So that's where I think that we ought to go to first in Africa, why we think this is important, not even how it will be accomplished. First of all, let us understand that the opening up knowledge is the way to go. And there's a culture about uh, around it that we can tap into, that we can key into. So that people will know more who we are, why we do the the, 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 the the things we do, why we talk the way we are, our mannerisms, our, you know, our thinking um, processes, and so on. That all of them are conditioned from our culture, where who we are as a people. So I think, for me personally, I think that's really the way to go for Africa. Thank you. Um, with the question, how do you envision the future for open culture and who's kind of leading the way? I, I mean, in all honesty, I, I don't know. Um, the, I think the, you know, the conversation we've been having so far reflects the complexity of the landscape now. Um, when we started doing this, it was about the simple instrument of an open, permissive, reusable license for materials that were once held in explicit or tacit copyright or enclosure. Uh, and I remember Brewster Kale saying once that, that he was sort of uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, kind of frustrated that the idea of the internet archive was that once all these things were available, there would just magically be this element of reuse and good being created. A, a, a service layer would just emerge. And I think we know now that that um, from uh, everyone's comments so far that, that this world of what happens next is more complicated and more closely married to the kind of intrinsic sins of, of uh, cultural heritage profession, national politics, uh, real life. So my understanding of the way that movements evolve is that a new sense of purpose and a new sense of leadership and resources and direction setting needs to happen uh, where we define the contours and outlines of what's, what's within scope. And I'm saying we, there can be many scopes, uh, but by and large uh, um, uh, energy gets re-injected and a direction and strategy gets put in place. Um, whether that's around the uh, reaching the next 5% of uh, collecting institutions, Brigitte said, 1% uh, of possibly digitized and licensed connections, uh, collections are now under open content. And where does that next 5% come from? On what conditions? How do we debias? All these things are possible points of, of uh, contention. So this is like a long blah, 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 opening up the problem space way of saying it, it depends, but it ain't gonna happen by itself. Um, uh, it needs uh, uh, tactics and strategy and energy and movement and funding and support and to really gain grounds in a measurable human lifetime. Uh, so I think it's the job of the elders of the movement to hoist hoist up their their big boy and big girl, big person pants and um, get it started. 
but where the leadership comes from, I think is from, um, from below and the so-called edges of the movement that once was, you know, Creative Commons open content. I think that that is part of kind of a refreshing um, aspect of, of where we are and where we want to go. Um, and I think uh, part of, you know, when we look back at, at like what Open Glam has been, it's been about reducing risk and navigating copyright and thinking about open licenses and digital and um, technological and financial issues. Um, now that we have a little bit more of a grasp on some of those very practical things, I think the real work is more localized. I think it has to do with slow approaches to really thinking critically about why we're doing the things that we're doing, who's involved, um, how to, how to um, bring more of the global majority into the landscape, right, in terms of the direction that all of this takes, because, you know, so far it's the global minority, both on the internet, but in terms of um, that, that representation bias that I was talking about earlier um, in shaping this direction. And um, I think those partnerships are going to be really important for, for rethinking what it is um, that kind of the future of open culture is. But I also think it, it needs to be something um, with which a lot of kind of um, discomfort arises in that process. And that's also really important because um, there's questions of authority, of control, um, of knowledge and narrative development, um, and even admitting and opening up in a way that exposes um, institutions and histories to um, these these critical rethinkings of um, how they've operated, how things came to be in their collection, who's been making decisions around them, and how all of that feeds into our understandings of open culture. Um, I also feel that open culture is um, one of the values that comes associated with open culture is participation and creating participation, creating voices, more spaces for more voices. And I've been very fortunate to be working on a project that um, I had an opportunity to see very closely how a European institution, specifically German, a German institution worked with um, their open collections involving, um, involving a very sensitive topic of involving people who they had once colonized and inviting their voices to reinterpret the collection. So I feel that when, um, when we don't for instance, as India is still slowly, still uh, slowly opening up and still having that dialogue, it becomes meaningful to participate in such initiatives where you're um, expressing your um, voice, expressing your um, knowledge, and sharing it with relation to um, an object or an artwork or anything at a museum. And of that object is open, and of course that includes your voice. And sorry for bungling this up so much, but um, I just meant to say that these are the kind of initiatives that I think can be more widely promoted, uh, can be more, um, can be examples. Um, the opportunity that I had to work with with a set of museums that are actually sharing their process of doing this. So I think there's a value of open opening the process also of how do you build participation with such communities? How do you involve the other voice? So I think we can look at a future where equitability is of uh, prime importance, it's priority, as Andrea also mentioned earlier. So um, I think that that's something that I envision um, in the future that we allow for more uh, participation. Yeah, go ahead. But I, I think that you also are touching an interesting point, Mirahi, which I think connects with what Edson, sorry, with what Mike was saying uh, around like participation and remixing, right? Like this idea that, oh, we didn't deliver fully on this promise of like making something with this, right? And I think that in a way for me, this like, Loosely, but like also relatedly connects with what I think is one of the challenges that we still have that I hope that we work more in the future that is around like the question of interoperability, right? Right now we face a lot of problems um, when it comes to that because we are all a little bit siloed on our way of, um, you know, sharing. 
So the only way in which you can share, I mean, with the exception of European, of course, right, that has taken like a lot of steps into being more integrated, into representing like the culture of Europe, et cetera. Then whenever an institution goes open, it's very hard to find their staff anywhere else but their website. And um, that creates like a lot of problems when you try to think, oh, how is people gonna participate and do Remix with this? If the only way where you can actually find the thing is in a website that unless you speak the language of the website, you are unable to access, to search, to do a lot of stuff with that. So it's like both like language interoperability, but also legal interoperability, technical interoperability. Like these are things that our open culture movement hasn't solved uh, by itself. And even if we want to move away from like the thorny conversations, which in, I partially agree with you, Mike, like a lot of institutions don't want to have this conversation, but like this conversation about interoperability is still a huge, huge portion of it. And we cannot like, you know, sometimes there are all these new shiny objects that get our attention, like you name it. Like back in the day, it was NFAT, now we have other shiny objects, <laughs> but we haven't still figured out like one of our main things that is like how people across time zones across the globe are going to reuse our materials if they are unable to even know that our materials exist. And I think this is like one key question that I hope we are able to solve in the future. <laughs>